Praise this Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of coming into your house to worship you in spirit and in truth, to hear your word from the Holy Scriptures, to have fellowship with each other, and then to receive your holy body and blood. God, I pray, will never take that for granted. Lord, this morning, I thank you that you want us to be one with you. Unity, not division. Lord, I pray that you would remove any contention, any division that Satan might want to use in order to tear your church apart. I ask for an outpouring of your spirit in a very incredible way this morning because I ask it in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace and unity from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. My fellow with you. It's a beautiful day outside, is it not? Yeah, it really is. So let me ask you, are you at peace with yourself this morning? Really? I mean, when you look around our world, um, it's pretty chaotic. Just in the last few days. Yeah. But we don't have to do that in our own lives. What's going on in our own lives? Look at the challenges that you have. Look at the concerns that, that are there. So, are you really at peace with yourself? With the world? With God? Or might there be some strife? Maybe some conflict and dissension? Maybe there's just down and out fighting. You know, this particular passage that I just read to you from the Gospel in St. John chapter 17, it's a very uh, unique portion of Holy Scripture. Because if you look in that passage of Scripture, you'll see where the title of it is called Jesus' High Priestly Prayer. That's what you'll see as the title of this particular passage of Holy Scripture. And it's called that because within this prayer that Jesus is praying, it is immediately before his crucifixion. And he's not praying for himself to be delivered from crucifixion. Which is probably what you and I would be praying for. No, I don't want to do that. Spare me from that. But Jesus, rather, is praying for the entire church universal. You know, he's not just praying for Peace in the Valley Lutheran Church. He's not just praying for Lutherans. Jesus is praying for the entire church universal. The entire church Catholic. Which is incredibly amazing, since there were major things that Jesus was facing. Yet he divorces himself from that and prays for this. His prayer is also known as priestly, <coughs> because Jesus is interceding before God the Father on behalf of all of God's people. So what is Jesus praying for in this high priestly prayer at a time when his own personal challenges are so incredibly prevalent and so incredibly intense? He's praying for unity among the brethren. Those who are believing or trusting My brothers and sisters, if you're going to tune me out, don't tune me out on this. Get this, all right? Get this. 
Unity, unity is critical in the church on the things that are essential for salvation. Let me repeat that. Unity is critical for the things that are essential for salvation. It's critical because it must happen. Failure is not an option. Okay? Without it, there will most definitely be dissension and conflict. You can count it. You can bet on it. It will happen, and it is happening. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, there are people within the church of Jesus the Christ who are not unified on the essentials for salvation. And yet, they still claim to be Christian. Hmm. For instance, there are people who do not believe that Jesus is truly the Son of God. But he's just He's just a good man, or he's a rabbi. He's a Jewish rabbi. Or he's just one of the prophets that have come down the pipe, like all the other Israeli prophets. There are those also who don't believe that salvation is only to be found in the person of Jesus the Christ and no one else. But rather, they believe that they can obtain salvation by way of some other means or some other deity or Jesus plus someone or something else. There are also those who believe that salvation is also predicated upon one's so-called good works or contributions that one is supposedly capable of being able to produce. Suffice to say that uh, there exists a significant amount of division within the church, which results, quite frankly, in disunity. And this there. Why do you think we have all these denominations for it? <laughs> Unity on the essentials of salvation is critical because you know what? Without it, there's no salvation. There is none. But, when believers who are united in the faith, you know what happens? They present a common front to the world. To the world, not just Benson, not just Arizona, not just to the United States, to the entire world. For which comes power and also influence. In other words, humanity is going to be influenced by what's going on in the church, not vice versa. That happens when there's unity. While in absence of that unity in humanity, humanity doesn't know what to make of it. This then results in confusion, to say the least. Where humanity looks at the church and they're unsure as to what the message of the church is. And they're so confused as to what the church is that they come away and they say, it's just a club. They get together on Sunday, whoopee. So, the humanity looks at the testimonies of the church and they're confused. Perhaps that 
is a significant factor as to why the church is not a popular attraction because people don't see unity within the church. What they see is conflict, discord, what have you, and they get that in the world. So, how does this happen to begin with? It doesn't happen, my brothers and sisters, when you go to bed at night, you're unified, and you wake up tomorrow, and all of a sudden you're divided. Never happens that way. Never. And it never will. Here's how this stuff happens. Disunity first starts with ignoring God's word among his people. Christians. They either don't bother to look at God's word as to what it says, or they input their own take on the word. For they read the scriptures in accordance with their own desires and not in accordance with scriptural interpretation. Where scripture interprets scripture. They subsequently put their own likes and their own dislikes and what they want the scriptures to say for their own benefit. You know what that's called? It's called the manipulation of the scriptures. And boy, Christians do it big time, all the time. Manipulate it like there's no tomorrow. Second, people also can desire the glories of man versus the glories of God. And so intend, intend, instead of taking God as his word, and remaining steadfast to it among the masses, they go right along with the masses. Because heavens, I don't want to cause an offense. I don't want people to be mad at me. So I just go along with them. Thereby glorifying the glories of man. Now, one particular subject of an essential for salvation for which there's strong division within the universal body of believers is that of Jesus being God Almighty, the eternal Son of God. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture in Exodus chapter 23. I want you to listen to this real close. I'm going to, I'm going to say this passage slowly. So I want you to listen to it very closely. Starting in verse 20 of that text. This particular passage deals with the conquest of the promised land that the Israelis were about ready to take possession of. And uh, God is speaking to Moses. And he tells Moses this, starting in verse 20. He says this. He says, Behold... I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I've prepared. And then in verse 21, he says, God says this, he says, pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. For my name is in him. Now, who is this angel that's being talked about in Exodus chapter 22? It's the angel of the Lord that that scripture says. Well, who's that? Who's the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord is Yahweh, which is the Greek term for God Almighty. Um, he's also the angel of the Lord, and that term is used 63 times in Holy Scripture. And it is not only the one who speaks for the Lord, but it is also the Lord Himself. For the angel of the Lord and the Lord are used interchangeably. It's one and the same. So, um, there's other passages of Scripture that support that in Genesis. But notice that this angel...
so of the Lord is the one who prepares a place for the people. So he's also the one who forgives or retains sins. So who is it that goes to prepare a place for us and who forgives or retains sins? my brothers and sisters, an essential for the Christian faith is that Jesus the Christ is truly the eternal Son of God. He's the Lord Almighty. He is Yahweh. He is God in the flesh. Yet, there are many who don't believe that. And they still call themselves Christian. My brothers and sisters, nothing is further from So, as a result of these causes, divisions continue to be epidemic in the church from the beginning to the present. People, therefore, tend to cluster into various groups as well as being very critical of others. Disunity within the church has been labeled as one of the greatest sicknesses. Bar none. So, what are the solutions for this dilemma? Lock the doors and go do something else? No. Obviously, prayer is the very first key factor and is the most important. Notice that Jesus prays, and he prays for all believers that we would be united by faith in him and in accordance with his word. We also need not to ignore God's word or to put our own slant on it. God's word is absolute truth which will unite his church. It will do that. It will also turn to glorify God as well as making his people being able to fulfill their respective callings in making disciples of all nations. Jesus desires all people, especially those who believe in him, to believe that he is truly the Son of God for which God has sent, and not just some Jewish rabbi or some bearded Jew that just lived 2,000 plus years ago. He wants you to know God. Jesus gives to us, his disciples, this wonderful privilege to bear witness of his glory as the Savior of the world. And not just one of many ways to heaven, but rather as the one and only way to salvation. Jesus gives to us, his church, the ability to be perfectly united, one in him. Perfect unity within the total triune God. All of this is incredibly tremendous and wonderful. It is. And the reason for that is because due to God's uh, love and His grace and His mercies towards us, He gives us the assurance that we will be with Him in heaven by and through saving faith in Him, God in the flesh. So as a result of all of that, by His grace and mercies, the Holy Spirit within us will continue to bear testimony of Jesus as being the Son of God who comes to take away the sins of the world and this through no contribution from us at all. Which is pretty amazing. So my brothers and sisters, these are the essentials of the Christian faith for which there must be unity. All the other things which are not essential for salvation are to be handled among each other with utmost respect. On those things, you and I can very much respectfully disagree with each other, while at the same time continue to walk hand in hand in Christian love for the sake of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. 
And brothers and sisters, by putting all of this practice into practice, the testimony of God's church in Jesus the Christ will have such a profound effect upon the world that it will make the wrong right. So my brothers and sisters, to him, to Jesus the Christ, be all honor, be all glory, and be all praise. We pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you send yourself to live, die, and rise again, that we might have forgiveness of sins, life eternal, and all the blessings of a restored creation. Father, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit we be unified in the fact that Christ is crucified and risen for the forgiveness of sins. And may that be a very powerful and influential force in the world in which we live today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.